Okay, so my talk is entitled A Little on V8 and WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is kind of my primary project these days, and I'm going to do a deeper dive into the tech technology behind WebAssembly. Um, and V8 is going to be kind of superficial. I'm going to be kind of broad. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I'm not going to teach you what an IC is or what a JIT compiler does. So I want to talk about basically three different things. So JavaScript is a little bit different than you know, some of, the, some of the VMs developed for, for Java are a little bit different than those uh, developed for JavaScript. I want to talk about why that is. I want to talk about V8 in particular, why it's unique, and why it's challenging to work in V8 maybe. And then I want to talk about this new project that I've been working on uh, in this collaboration across industry, across browsers, across companies, and it's called WebAssembly. <coughs> I'll start my talk with a lie. <laughs> uh, JavaScript is unique and interesting. Uh, those are uncontroversial things, I think. Um, whether it's a great language is up for debate. <laughs> People have different opinions. But it's no doubt that it is the language of the web. It's everywhere the browser is. People use it to drive their web applications from small scripts that just do doodads to huge things like Gmail and Maps. JavaScript is a actual, actually a scripting language. They, truth in advertising there. Although people use it as more of an application development language these days. That pretty much means that programs are going to show up in source form, which actually has challenges. It has certain advantages, but uh, it definitely means certain things for the VM. It's been a classically slow language until V8 came along, and other browser engines have uh, also come up to speed as well. Uh, JavaScript has a prototype-based object model, which is a poor imitation of what self would give you. Um, it also has functional features, so you can do closures. <laughs> So you can kind of have a little broken version of everything you not like about other languages. Um, it's also untyped, uh, which is terrible from a theoretical perspective, terrible from a performance perspective, um, but nice from a user perspective because they're not uh, tasked with actually making their programs right. Okay, so it also has got a bunch of oddball features which really don't, they don't really impinge on the design. They're not like central to the design, but they kind of, you know, they're always little gotchas like, the scoping rules in JavaScript are super weird. There's this, there's this hoisting of uh, local variables, so it's always unclear where the scope actually begins. It's got a val, so you can generate, you can execute new code essentially within a scope. I won't talk about every one of these things, but lots of weird stuff. Um, and it's got some objects that are falsy, and you know, other languages like Python have weird uh, special cases like that. It's also got the ability to delete the elements in the middle of arrays. That's kind of horrible to deal with, and also arguments objects. Some of these things show up in other languages. That doesn't make JavaScript completely unique, but it is kind of a witch's brew of horrible things. So first challenge, programs show up in source form. That means that parsing is actually part of the runtime. So as opposed to the JVM, where you're dealt bytecode, and parsing bytecode is pretty fast, parsing source code is an order of magnitude slower than parsing bytecode. So I didn't do measurements of V8's parser, but kind of ballpark figure is like a megabyte, low megabyte uh, per second parsing source code. But a binary format like Java bytecode or WebAssembly is more like 100 megabytes a second. So that, that actually makes a difference. <clears throat> the other thing about the programs always being presented in source form is that new language features show up in the source code, which means that the VM has to support every feature. There's no such thing as taking a source feature and blowing it away and just generating the same old bytecode. The VM has to be upgraded. Thankfully, most JavaScript VMs come in browsers, which have a release schedule. So they're coming out every six weeks. There's like an automatic update. So you're kind of like automatically getting a new version of JavaScript every six weeks, for example, if you're using Chrome. Um, so the, but that basically means that a VM has to be upgraded for every tiny feature in the language. OK, so take a look closer at the prototype-based uh, object model uh, in JavaScript. So there's no classes. There's only functions in JavaScript. So the way you create objects is you actually instantiate functions, which seems kind of bogus to me, but that's the way it is. So people uh, model, uh, so you basically say new of a function, which seems kind of weird. And the function actually initializes the, uh, the fields of the object. They're called properties in JavaScript. So you model. Um, methods on your prototypes by basically installing functions on the prototype object. So you can get the prototype object of a function and put another function on it. For example, installing a print function here. 
and then to model subclassing so you can have some kind of inheritance relationship, you just chain the prototypes together. <clears throat> and, uh, and this works because every time you look up a property on a JavaScript object, if you don't find it in that object, you look at this prototype, you don't find it there, you keep going up the chain. So it, it seems really simple. It ends up causing a lot of complications, especially with pervasive mutation in the language. Another thing people do is failing the whole um, setting up an inheritance chain with prototypes, they'll just create an object literal that has a bunch of closures in it. Um, so closures can um, close over uh, local variables, even mutable local variables. So you can basically produce a little object um, that behaves a bit like uh, an object that you would write the old style. So it's a little bit more compact. And so there's nice syntax in JavaScript for doing object literals. <clears throat> so another challenge that shows up because of JavaScript's untyped nature is that everything is, there, you don't see types in the program. So there's no help for the programmer to know what something is. There's no help for the VM to know what something is. So every time, essentially, at a function boundary, anything outside of that, you have no clue what type it could be. So type inference is essentially limited. And that's also partly due to the scoping mechanism, uh, the, sp the scoping and semantics of JavaScript. So essentially anything outside of your scope is usually mutable, so you really can't make any static guarantees. You have to make some, some, uh, some dynamic uh, speculative optimizations. So the other thing about it being untyped is that basically every operation in the language is overloaded to do various things. And I'll show you what plus means in JavaScript. If you look at the ES6 spec, it's written, thankfully it's written in HTML, so you can jump around in the different subroutines and the semantics of, of the plus operation. <clears throat> you don't have to understand, you don't have to read this slide, but you can see <laughs> there's this sequence of steps. Part of it has to deal with like the evaluation of expressions, um, but you can assume that if, if plus were a strict operation, you already have two values, what do you do? There's like a type case. Maybe one's a string, then the other one should be a string. Okay, maybe one's a number, uh, then the other one should be converted to a number, okay? So you start clicking around. Aha, the first thing you have to do is a two primitive. The two primitive operation has this you know, table and it has a bunch of other things that are implied and a bunch of cases. And it may be, this may be a little bit verbose to read just because it's semi-prose, but that's not the real problem. The real problem is that it keeps turtling down. So two string implies a two primitive. Uh, and you dig into what two primitive does. Oh, there's a two number, and two number actually does, you know, there's this big case for what converting strings to numbers does, and there's this stuff. You notice there's links in between. Two number actually goes to two primitive, and the original one actually goes to, yeah. So you start getting confused very quickly. Two primitive can actually look up something on an object, which means that we're going to this get method routine, which is actually a prototype, uh, excuse me, a property access, which is actually there, and there can actually be a two object conversion involved. And actually there's another shortcut case over here where you can actually just directly call a user method. And of course, all of this, this, this big blue box, I'm not even gonna show, there's like a whole transitive closure of, of horror behind that. Um, this also is another mechanism to do interposition. And then uh, ES6 added proxies so you can intercept even all of that too. So this whole <coughs> stuff basically makes addition observable. So you can observe essentially every operation in, that a JavaScript program does uh, by feeding it weird stuff. Okay, so if we go back to what this really means, what they're really trying to do is make this happen, either a number conversion and a number add or a string conversion and a string add. But due to, due to sort of uh, design choices piling upon each other, uh, you end up with side effects pervasive. And of course, user programs that are uh, w not well behaved, they can essentially mutate anything. So basically, all bets are off as soon as you see a plus in the program. You can kind of sign, you can kind of sign up for that if it was like a regular property access. You can maybe justify the object model is complicated. But plus, that's pretty bad. So just going back to this example, um, you have an object literal. This is what people kind of want to do is have a two string and that's kind of what they're going for and that's kind of easy to understand. But all the rest of it is kind of a, a train wreck in my opinion. Um, but I shouldn't make judgments about JavaScript. Anyway, uh, so eval is another thing that can happen in JavaScript. Um, this shows up in other languages too. Where, where an eval is naked, like syntactically showing up, 
It's like you take that string and were to paste it in and execute it. That's the sort of uh, intuitive semantics. Uh, obviously, that's not how it's implemented. Um, but that means stuff like you can modify local variables. So here, we're actually passing a string which assigns to a local variable. Uh, when that gets evaluated in this scope, it basically overwrites that. So raise your hand if you think you know what this will produce. Guesses. Yeah, very good. All right. Well, it could be worse. I mean, you could introduce a new function and then capture the entire environment and then pass it out. So, so eval is pretty bad. And, you know, most programs use this. It, it's becoming um, rarer and rarer. Um, so it's not a main problem, but it's like, it's always one of those things that's in language. It's always going to have like this, this sort of, you know, you have to be prepared for this case. Other stuff, you know, this, I mentioned the funky scoping. So like, variables kind of get lifted to the top of scopes. So because this is, again, JavaScript is presented as a source language to the VM, every single VM has to get the scoping rules right, which seems really kind of dumb, actually. And there are differences. And in, in there, historically, there have been differences in how scoping has worked between different implementations. So that's kind of fun. Uh, with scopes, also, uh, I won't get into that. But you know, more and more fun with, with scopes. There's this sort of implicit arguments object, which normally you don't want to materialize. So before you have a really heavyweight JIT, there's kind of this lightweight escape analysis for dealing with arg arguments objects, which was a special case, to make certain kinds of accesses to the arguments object fast without doing the full-blown escape analysis. Um, and that was kind of required to make typical programs that actually do arg use arguments objects uh, faster. And then, there's generator functions, which is kind of a form of coroutines. Um, those can be implemented in various ways, and they're typically not optimized just because of weird semantics of what generators mean in JavaScript. Okay, does anybody actually have questions about JavaScript? I'm not a JavaScript expert. I don't want to answer questions about JavaScript, but I feel obligated to give you that opportunity. Okay, so what is, how does V8 approach this problem? and what makes it unique and interesting. So historically, V8 was the first really fast JavaScript virtual machine. And the reason why that is is because it was developed by Lars Bach and team at Argus, who had a lot of experience in VMs and used all the techniques that they had developed for self and small talk and other languages. And they basically applied them to JavaScript. And some of those weirder language features, they get in the way, but the basic ideas do transfer over. Uh, just historically, that time frame is roughly 2008 launched with Chrome. It was secret. They developed it in quite a hurry. I think it was about a year and a half that V8 was developed. And the thing that made V8 kind of a breakthrough was that already it was 10 times faster than the competition at release. It was the only VM that was doing a JIT for JavaScript, although Mozilla claims to have uh, been developing a JIT at the same time. Um, there's some dispute there about who did first. I don't think it's important. Um, but definitely, that J compiler was a huge, huge improvement, as everybody here should know by now. And it's been made faster a lot in that time period. So adding, uh, optimizing JIT compiler, which I'll talk about a bit, made it another 10 times faster. The other thing is that the main technique for making JavaScript objects fast, which is called hidden classes, which we'll call them maps, and I will show some details later. Um, those were adapted directly from the self VM. There's actually three JITs inside of V8 today. There's the first original JIT, which is basically walks over the AST and spits out code. If you look at maybe the Dragon book on compilers, that's roughly where you get those techniques. Just flat out generate code as fast as possible, use the inline caches so that all those property accesses basically have a fast case and they collect type feedback. The first optimizing JIT was developed pretty quickly thereafter. It was called Crankshaft. And it, and it employed type feedback and de-optimization, which are known techniques I'll talk a little bit about. And Crankshaft has actually been, uh, my team uh, also improved Crankshaft quite a lot <coughs> before we started working on TurboFan, which was released in 2015. And uh, I'll talk, I, w I really want to talk about TurboFan, but I won't talk about TurboFan. <laughs> uh, the other thing is that V8 started with a pretty simple garbage collector and has moved to progressively more complicated collector collectors to get um, to get better 
better ergonomics and better uh, performance. Just like, what's that jargon word, jank? Jank basically is pause. We typically use the term jank when it's applied to like a UI, like missing frames. But it basically means pause times. OK, so uh, because JavaScript is, comes in as source code, there's not really a binary form where you can kind of use that binary form as this, this sort of sketch of what your VM data stru structures would look like. Instead, you have to sort of build the program as you're going. And in fact, scripts typically are big enough that you can't really build the entire meta representation of the program for an entire script when you first see it. Um, so you typically only generate a couple of functions and some objects and enough kind of data on the side that will allow you to lazily generate the rest of it as you're going. So back to that challenge of parsing. So parsing has to be fast. It turns out parsing JS is also hard. There's other sort of language um, mistakes that make it so essentially impossible to use a parser generator. And the parser generator is a, kind of your best bet to get a super fast uh, parser these days. So there's, in every engine, there's a different handwritten recursive descent parser. Um, and like I said, they're all kind of in the sort of megabyte a second range. So V8 uh, tries to be lazy. What that means is that we don't do a full parse for the entire script. We have actually two modes of parsing. We can parse the program, but only kind of find the, the sketch of its structure, basically find where the function boundaries are. Or we could do a parse, which is typically only for a function which builds an entire AST for that one function. And the difference is about a 3x performance. So if we can parse the whole script, find where the functions are, we can build the AST only for the, maybe the main function, the sort of outer function, and then defer the rest of that to, to be lazily generated. And lazy parsing basically happens the first time you really need the AST for that function, which is usually the first time you execute that function. Uh, another thing that we've been working on is also try to to uh, hide the latency of that parsing to basically parse the script while it's coming down over the wire. So we can do essentially incremental work on parsing the script. Yeah? Ben, so what's the biggest thing that you expect to parse? I mean, if everything's like 20 bytes, you don't care. But you must be seeing massive programs with care yes. to Yes. So we've seen uh, 100 megabyte JavaScript files. <laughs> on the web? Yes. People are doing that with Asm.js, and I'm, I'm going to talk about why we don't think that's such a great idea. But a two, <laughs> two megabyte script yeah. is common. <laughs> Gmail has several hundreds of kilobytes of, they cut their things up into multiple scripts in order to, to get around this problem. <clears throat> so lazy compilation is basically code for compile it the first time you execute it. So V8 originally didn't have an interpreter, um, and the first time you execute a JavaScript function, uh, the first time you need it, you basically make a stub. And then the first time you execute that function, that's when you do the parse. And you produce the, the parse tree. And then you run through the, the full code gen compiler to generate the unoptimized machine code. All right, so I'm going to talk a bit about object model. Um, who knows classically how like hidden classes work in, in a JavaScript VM or a Python VM? It's kind of like 10 people. Okay, so I'll talk a bit about this. I'm going to kind of sweep some details under the rug. We, we do some more than this, um, but this will give you a basic idea. So, okay, we're going to start again with JavaScript, just having uh, functions, which are the things that we use to instantiate objects. So we first create this object here, my object, and what V8 does is it generates a map. That's basically a description of a layout of an object. Um, JavaScript requires every object that's created by uh, instantiating a function to essentially remember which function it came from. That is stored in the map. So the map remembers that it came from my object. Um, I'll get to what these mean and how we get them, but size is basically the uh, size of the whole object, and there may be essentially dead data in here, and then the number of properties is the number of properties that exist in the object. Okay, I'm, this isn't exactly what they're called. I'm sketching. I'm not on the runtime team, but I understand enough of it to give you an overview. Okay, so the first time you assign to an object, we're going to create a new map. And the reason why we want to do that is because mutating the metadata of your VM is fraught with peril, but also we'll, um, by uh, later we'll want to have many objects share the same map, so we'll, we'll be able to chain the map so that you can have 
uh, way to get from one map to another. Okay, because there may be objects that are that are around that are that have the original map, while there's objects that have the new map. Okay, so we create a new map. It's uh, also for my object. It's also it. We add the property to the map, and then we actually just put the storage of the value in the object. Okay. All right, and we change the map of the object, so we transition it to a new shape. All right, the next time we assign a property, we're going to create another map, and we're going to transition from the old map to a new map and add a new entry for this new property, and then we just stick it in there. Okay, so then we're, gonna, then we're finally finished with executing this uh, function. We're going to return the object. And then uh, properties can be added essentially any time to any object. They can also be removed. Um, but this may happen way later in the program. You add another property to the object, and again, you get a new map. You may extend it. Eventually, you see you're going to run out of space here. So when you run out of space, those are not going to be fast properties anymore. Those are going to be stored in a different way, for example, in a ha as a hash table. Okay, so there's a couple of things going on. There is a statically uh, determined or estimated expected number of properties. So if you were to look at a function and see there is a this dot that and this dot that and this dot the other thing, you can say, oh, maybe there's three properties. So like with even out of doing anything smart, you can come up with a heuristic for about how big you should start for this object. And then we can refine that later uh, with dynamically tracking how big the objects tend to get. So we can either put that data in the, in the map by recording essentially um, from going back to the map to some representation of my object and saying, oh, usually these objects end up with three properties. So then we can allocate fewer uh, wastes, slop slots at the end. We call that select tracking. Okay, so what that means is that the maps basically create a tree. It's actually a forest. Um, every function essentially that is used as a constructor will be a root here. So those maps, uh, there's no like root map for all objects. And these transitions, these, <coughs> excuse me, the links here, those are basically, as you add this new property, you should go from this map to this map. Does that make sense? So if you have an object which is currently has this map and you add an, a gauze property, then it goes to that map. And essentially the path of the tree encodes, uh, you can think of it as the path of the tree encodes the properties, but actually there's a, there's a list of the properties in, the, in each storage of these maps. And you can do fun tricks with like store, like shape, uh, excuse me, sharing the storage of those list of properties so that you don't use essentially all the memory for every map. Okay. So we also have the notion of a stable map. These are essentially leaf maps. They are leaf maps that we have, through some heuristics, determined that they probably will not ever have any children. And the way we do that is, you know, is through estimation of the program is running, and can anyone think of an idea of how you might use this in your VM? Why this might be useful? So do you uh, need for a state, for example? Because if, if you know that they don't change, for example, then yeah, you can optimize for them. Yes, so how exactly? Give it. Uh, well, if it's a tree, for example, you might want to flatten the tree and uh, to have a uh, single yes. cache local. Yes, uh, that's one thing, indeed. So we do compression of the tree, so we kind of collect some long chains together. There's another optimization you can do, which is, if you know that a map, that an object has this map, then you can assume that it's never going to have another map, because there's no way to get out of that. There's no transitions away from that. Nobody ever adds anything, right? So as soon as you check the map once, any sort of code below that, you never have to do any more checks again. Um, so that basically means you can remove tons of checks and code. But what's the problem? That means that this could be violated later, right? Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it can't happen in the future. In that case, we de-optimize the code, and we basically roll back all those assumptions, and we can start again with unoptimized code and make it no longer stable. <coughs> Early questions about that? <laughs> okay, so if we again go back to uh, prototypes, I'll show you just Example, um, we actually store the information for an object's prototype in the map. So the map and the prototype are basically a pair. We could store them in the object. And in fact, people have explored uh, doing that to reduce certain kinds of polymorphic patterns. Uh, but we do this so that we can do more specialization. 
Um, so by knowing an object's map, you implicitly know its prototype. So what that means is that a typical object will look like this. Uh, this will be the actual object, which has a map. And the, pro and the map refers to a prototype object, which is a, an actual JavaScript object, which it itself has a map, right? And the great thing is that normally, uh, if your program is well behaved, the map of this prototype will become stable, which means that the prototype object is essentially fixed. And that's where all the functions are. So if you know that this and this are stable maps, then you only need one map check here to guard essentially a virtual dispatch in, in JavaScript code. Um, and then deoptimization will happen if either one of, if this object changes uh, or that object changes. Sorry, if those maps become uh, no longer stable. Okay, I'm gonna talk about types. God, I wish there was types in JavaScript. There seems to be a large community of people that wishes there was types in JavaScript, and that's why TypeScript exists. That's why we have explored type systems for JavaScript. But alas, there are not. So instead, we resort to dynamic profiling to figure out what types are. So normally, this is kind of an assumption that tends to hold in most programs that dynamism or polymorphism is site-specific. That's kind of like an underlying assumption in VMs. You saw that when we talk about inline caches that for a site, you normally see a stable set of types, a stable set of um, object shapes, for example. So you can basically assume with some high probability that what happened last time is gonna happen again. Okay, except that they lied. You know, they, the, the, the last time you execute this, the fifth time you execute this, you finally get the, something different. And if you've made a specialization decision in between, you have to have a backup plan, which is where the optimization comes in. So if we take a more complicated example of JavaScript <coughs> code, it, as humans, we can kind of see that this induction variable is an integer, and you can use integer arithmetic. And an optimizing compiler can see that too, uh, but we don't want to run the optimizing compiler for, for every function just to figure out the stupid induction variable is an integer. So instead we use some dynamic um, tracking. So we record multiple different things when we're executing this function. So we're going to record the type for i and the comparison and the type for i in this uh, increment. We're gonna record the target for a new adder because again in JavaScript, this is just a reference to a name and that may change later. So we want to be really sure that that's not changing. So we can just record that. Uh, then for dispatches, we can record maps coming into uh, dispatch and also the targets of those calls and then um, also for this call at the end. And then <clears throat> that information gives rise to possible optimization. So now we can know for sure that we should use int arithmetic. Um, we should specialize the int arithmetic. Knowing the target for call allows you to inline and then the maps allow you to to insert map checks and also remove map checks in inline again. So that's all orchestrated by having some heuristic to decide when to actually compile optimi optimized code and then those optimizations are orchestrated by the optimizing compiler, which is magic Mickey. And then when that happens, you can optimize code out. Right? That's not groundbreaking. We're talking about, we've been talking about systems that have been doing this for 20 years. Um, and deoptimization happens on the failed speculation the main problem that we seem to keep having in JavaScript and other people have in other dynamic languages is this cycle, the optimize the optimize cycle. So what we in, do in V8, we have some counters that sort of disable uh, optimization after too many deopt loops, and then other, um, other things lead us to uh, figuring out what compiler analysis went wrong that we kept specializing something to the wrong thing, maybe we're being too over-optimistic. And these typically are the kind of performance problems that we see and want to fix. It's that it's not that the optimized code is bad, although that can happen. It's usually that you optimize and deoptimize, optimize and deoptimize. Especially with code in the wild, which doesn't look very much like benchmarks. It has a lot of polymorphism. And when they run really slow, it's usually because of this. Okay, so this is a play on words if you know German. Um, there are three tiers in in V8 now, actually. Um, the full code unoptimized thing, Shrek, the ugly thing, um, but it's actually fast. And we have crankshaft optimizing compiler and turbofan optimizing compiler. How do we orchestrate all this? 
Good question. I don't know. <laughs> we actually have a fourth tier now. So now we actually have an interpreter in V8. And this is not turned on in production, but this is something that we want to use for faster startup, saving memory, and um, basically reducing the latency of startup. We, our technique in doing this, instead of writing, writing an interpreter by hand in either C++ or assembly, is instead you write in a, essentially a language that looked like uh, Cliff's macro assembler, but actually generates compiler IR for TurboFan, and then we use TurboFan to compile the actual interpreter itself. So that way you actually get a portable interpreter that's actually pretty fast. And the good thing is, is that when you tweak TurboFan's uh, code generation or register allocation, you get a faster interpreter. Um, and actually, that means that we have very little platform-specific code for the interpreter. There's a little bit dealing with calling conventions and stuff like that. And we make use of the fact that TurboFan runs on 11 architectures, so the interpreter runs on 11 architectures. Okay, so I'm, that's all I'm going to really say about the runtime and uh, JIT compilers in, in V8. So I'm going to talk a little bit about garbage collection. So there's this... I was talking with Tony and Richard about this impossible triad. You want all three of these things. And we'll probably, with GC technology today, there's a trade-off between some dimensions, but we have some, we have some new techniques to get better here. They're not quite as good as the state-of-the-art fully concurrent collectors, um, but we're able to do some neat tricks, and I'll show you a couple of them. So V8 has a generational garbage collector with incremental collection. So what that means is that semi-space collections are usually on the order of a couple of milliseconds. Those are, those are copying, basically. By limiting the size of the, of the young generation, you can limit the size of that copying cost. It's really fast for most programs that um, don't have a lot of surviving objects. And within that time window, it does extremely well. It's actually really hard to beat, and even in throughput. Then for collecting the old generation, we have an incremental collector. So all of the work to find all the live objects, you split it up into incremental marking stages. And those allow you to have lower pauses. So these pauses occur, occur more regularly, uh, but they're smaller. And that's actually configure, configurable. You can essentially choose how much marking work you want to do, and then estimate how much time that marking work is going to do, and tune the, talk, the pause time. And I'm, I'm going to talk about that a bit. Um, there's also you know, the final. Uh, Compaction takes some time to do an atomic pause at the end. Um, and also, yeah. So those are on the order of milliseconds. So we're not state of the art in the sense that it, it close to what uh, concurrent collectors are doing for pause times, but we actually have really good throughput. <coughs> okay, so with incremental marking, as I mentioned, we can choose how much mark work that we want to do in a particular cycle, in a particular um, quantum. And the way we, that means that we can basically, we can't change the total amount of work because we still have to find all the live objects, but we can choose how to slice up those pauses. So we're going to use that when, we, when it comes to actually dealing with this morphous thing out there, which we call users, who apparently perceive latency from time to time. And we discovered, actually it's not that surprising, that latency is critical for the foreground tab in Chrome, right? You want to have essentially latency uh, oriented uh, configuration the GC, and you want to have memory oriented configuration the GC for the other tabs because they're roughly idle. Um, so we can do we can essentially afford to do uh, more aggressive garbage collection for the background tabs if we can do that sort of uh, as background work and save the memory. But we want to we want to keep the low latency for the foreground tabs. And you can keep the low latency, but you can also hide the latency. Where are you going to hide it? And so Rick Hudson had this idea, which I think he was joking, but we took seriously, that you put the GC latency where nobody is looking. Which sounds kind of crazy, but actually, there is a place to put it where nobody is looking. Since we're rendering frames of a UI, there is a certain amount of time that we need to generate the frame. And some of that is JavaScript execution time, which does animation, changes the web page. And then when JavaScript is finished, that, that is committed to the, the internal state of what a frame is going to look like, and then that's handed to you know, a C++ level uh, browser stuff, which does all the compositing and drawing. Right? And then JavaScript's actually idle during that time, and this may happen on another thread. So that idle time is a perfect place to put GC. 
If we were not so smart, what may happen is the garbage collection time happens during JavaScript time, which means that that commit is too late. So there's nothing that the compositor thread can do. It just got the work too late because the GC was in there. So instead, oh man, this can show up. Here we go. So instead, what you want to do, uh, this is the missed frame case, where basically we want to execute all of this JavaScript and get it done before this frame, but the, unfortunately, that GC happened there. So instead, if we knew that we had some GC work to do by estimating some magic number, we could move it earlier before it's really, really needed into one of these other idle periods. And that's easier to do if you can configure it and make it smaller and you know how big those idle periods will be. So V8 actually has online heuristics to estimate the amount, how fast we are currently doing young generation collection speed. So that will help it figure out how big a young generation should be to make those pauses small. And it figures out about how fast we're able to mark um, objects, so that, that is an online estimation, so it's not like a static heuristic like marking 500 objects a millisecond or something like that. Uh, we're actually measuring that. And then we also measure the, the, uh, the mark compact speed at the end too. Then with those numbers, we can estimate how much time it's going to take to do a particular amount of GC work. And then we can have our friend Chrome, this giant operating system uh, masquerading as a browser, schedule that time into these idle periods between frames. And that actually happens a lot. So for real web pages that have real animations and a lot of stuff going on, almost all the GC work happens during idle time. And that translates into uh, real savings um, in terms of how janky the frame rate is. So we, we define a metric on how janky frame is. Frame rate is, which is like how, how far away you are from the frame rate that you're trying to get, like how late those frames are. And this, this technique uh, improves a lot. Unfortunately, I lost the slide on what those numbers were. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about V8. WebAssembly is implemented inside of V8, but uh, I want to give you guys an opportunity to ask questions about V8. This is kind of a natural transition point in the, in the talk. Uh, right. Okay, so the the way uh, an animation frame works, let's see if we can go back and show this. Yeah, so the way an animation frame works is that uh, JavaScript has this event loop built in where JavaScript is getting called for every frame. And JavaScript does some work at the beginning of the frame and it modifies JavaScript objects but also modifies the web page itself, the DOM elements, okay? And when that finishes, like JavaScript is finished from, with that event, and that event mm -hmm. is terminated, then it's time for um, then it's time for the compositor. Uh, stupid animation. Yeah, then it's time for the compositor to get going, right? So the earlier JavaScript finishes, the more time the compositor has, which is C code. It doesn't doesn't access the JavaScript heap. The more time it has to finish that frame. So basically, if you can move this over there, then the, that runs in. In parallel. Good? Okay. How would your GC scheduling be different for, um, say, server side JavaScript and applications where you don't have the same kind of uh, interactivity? Yeah, so in that case, there are not. So all this is done through by knowing about the scheduler and knowing that you can submit tasks to the scheduler. And the tasks, you can configure the size. And this basically, the scheduler is not available at all. You can essentially turn this stuff off. And then the, the, uh, the incremental marking steps have a different heuristic for tuning for sort of throughput case. And then you're, you're basically not doing any sort of preemptive uh, scheduling of this. So you end up doing the same amount of GC work, but it ends up essentially all in this like long execution time. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's time to play games, unless there are other questions about V8. All right, so I can turn with the. So this.
This is what people want to do on the web. This is a 3D game which someone used the Unity game framework uh, to write. They wrote code in C Sharp and C++ and they compiled it to the web. This is WebAssembly, um, but what typically people have been doing before is they've been compiling this C++ code into JavaScript. And for various reasons, oh, that's enough. <laughs> I think I got the picture. Uh, for various reasons, that's not a good solution. So V8 is you know, optimized to run very polymorphic JavaScript. It's not optimized to run JavaScript, which is a C program, which is emulating a C heap. Um, the pressure is coming from competition with installed mobile apps. So people are basically developing web apps that are as complicated as Android or iOS apps. Um, obviously with those two platforms, there's portability issues and there's lock-in issues. Um, people are basically wanting to take bigger and bigger apps and compile them to the web. They already have this huge pile of code. They already use OpenGL. And they basically want to make it work on the web because they're sick of dealing with 30 different platforms or dealing with the in intricacies of Windows. Um, the other thing that's really great about you know, the pressure to bring this native code to the web is that people typically write their audio and video codecs, which is some new uh, compression technique for a video in C++. So they can run in one context, and if you can do that and compile it and then run it on the web, it basically gives the web a new video codec. So we've got uh, pretty good information from YouTube that they would like to be able to experiment with more efficient video codecs, and they could save a lot of money if they could deploy new codecs. Mm -hmm. And if you have to deploy a new codec by getting C++ either plugins or codecs standardized and put into the browser itself, into Chrome, then that slows down the whole process. But if instead you can compile it and run it on the web, you can experiment much quick, more quickly. I mentioned that j people are compiling to JavaScript. And <coughs> JavaScript, JavaScript has been going through contortions to serve as a compilation target for this for a couple of years. I don't think that serves JavaScript well. It doesn't serve V8 well. Um, so instead, we'd like to come up with something that actually does serve this use case. The other thing is that um, machines, almost all machines these days that are popular have some kind of vector unit. And you can't get to that through JavaScript very easily. There's been a proposal to add SIMD operations to JavaScript um, to get use of the hardware. But there's various challenges to making that uh, performant. And the other thing is that people want to take their C++ code, which has threads, and compile it to the web. And JavaScript does not have threads. You would have to do some CPS uh, transformation or some other weird stuff. Um, so, so WebAssembly is an attempt to try to address these, this motivation. So I want to give a small detour through ASM.js. What is that thing? So ASM.js is a way to get a very low-level type system in JavaScript through um, annotations. So normal JavaScript, as you saw before, what does a plus mean? It could be horrible, right? It could invoke user code, it could have side effects, it could be any one of these things. The VM has to generate backup code in case this doesn't always hold. Um, but instead, if you know this statically, just these couple of facts, you can actually generate an N32 add. So if you know that uh, X is an N32 and Y is an N32, you add them together and you strip away the upper bits, which is what this operation does, then actually you can't, you can't observe any of the, the upper bits from that, that calculation. You can't observe the doubleness of it, and then you can generate an N32 add, which is what you intended all along. And the same way you can do that and generate double arithmetic. So that's a way to get, to get rid of the whole overloading semantics. You can essentially truncate away all of the, all of the JavaScriptness. So you can compile C code that does just arithmetic. The other thing is that you can, uh, JavaScript has array buffers, which are basically big chunks of, of memory that you can uh, bang on. And if you make a closure around a particular array buffer, then you can make that array buffer your C memory. And you can emulate a C machine. And that's what ASM.js does. It's basically a stylized way <coughs> to create closures around a particular memory that have all kind of low-level typed arithmetic inside. Um, so Firefox and, and Internet Explorer, uh, so sorry, Microsoft, Microsoft Edge, uh, both support this specific dialect. They have specific validation rules for this type dialect 
dialect uh, to generate this low-level code. And there's still other problems because you inherit uh, some semantics from JavaScript that are unfortunate too. ASM.js also comes with a big tool chain, so it's based on forked LLVM. Um, so you can just take LLVM, compile your C++ code, ASM.js comes out. And then making all of that work actually requires a lot of sort of supporting code underneath, so an implementation of OpenGL on top of WebGL, which is a web, uh, <coughs> which is a, a web standard for, for doing OpenGL-like stuff. So you essentially have to do a translation from OpenGL to WebGL, which unfortunately is actually implemented in OpenGL, so there's a layer in between. Um, but also, there's lots of stuff available in, in Emscript in like game engines and applications and even benchmarks. So that was just, that's kind of like history. Um, and I'll talk about why WebAssembly uh, is better. Um, just one more thing on that, on ASM.js. So we built TurboFan, uh, one of the main use cases was to, was to do better on ASM.js-like code. Um, we use a lot of advanced type analysis in, in TurboFan, which you've seen some of my previous talks, maybe you get a, a flavor of. <clears throat> and without using any custom solution, maybe, maybe we sort of have some self-denial about this being a custom solution. But using generally apl applicable optimizations, we are basically to get, to get within this small bit of percentage uh, of performance on the versus a custom solution that supports ASM.js uh, directly. That's without really any inter procedural optimizations. Um, and, the, and the hope is that all of the effort that we put into optimizing uh, in the general case also helps with normal JavaScript. We're still working on delivering that last part. But actually, we're going to also try the other thing. So we're basically betting on two horses at once. Um, we also already do have a validator which validates as ASM.js subset. It translates to WebAssembly internally. Um, that gives us the ability to do interprocedural optimizations that we don't do with just using TurboFan's sort of normal uh, analysis. All right, so we talked around why do we want it, how, it, how ASM.js was a stepping stone to get here but wasn't quite good enough. But what is, what is it actually? And more importantly, what is it not actually? Because it's important not to overpromise here. So we're really talking about a compilation target for native code. That means these days, C and C++, although other languages will follow in the future, and more than welcome to follow in the future. It's a new capability for the web. So we're not trying to chop out a part of the web platform and, uh, and put something else in its place, but it's really adding capabilities. And especially things which you really can't express in JavaScript, like Float32 semantics, single precision float, uh, or SIMD, those things are really tough. You can, in, you can integrate WebAssembly with JavaScript. You can call Web, web APIs from, from uh, WebAssembly. And it also gives you this other kind of <clears throat> contract that you'll get pretty good performance out of it. In fact, it's basically assumed that you will do ahead of time compilation and get C level performance out of WebAssembly. That means fast calling conventions, we're not boxing anything under the hood. There's no GC pauses. And when you load a module and it's ready to go, the JIT is not running. Not that I don't like JITs. I love JITs. OK, so this makes our life more simple internally. I'll just show you a picture of that in case you're interested. But normally, uh, if you would have ASM.js code, which we still labor on the, under the, the uh, delusion is regular JavaScript, we just run it through a normal compiler pipeline means it, get, it goes to unoptimized code first, and then it, gets, it warms up, and then we go to TurboFan uh, for all the hot ASM.js code to generate optimized code. And that means that there's a lot of JavaScript analysis to figure out. There's like range analysis, uh, truncation analysis, and a lot of lowering steps, a lot of awesome, fun compiler stuff, all the way to get to this machine level sort of layer here at the back, where instead with WebAssembly, you can just skip all that and go directly in. Um, so this decoding step is going to be way faster than going through this whole warm-up pipeline. So, and the other part of that is that we can sk we can skip some of this stuff for ASM.js uh, modules and, and be able to get some of the same guarantees. You have this extra step, so there's going to be some more latency, but you essentially are able to get rid of some of the sort of custom ASM.js um, Verific um, analysis in the compiler. All right. So, 
let's actually look at what this WebAssembly language is like. Uh, it's got some data types, not very many, which is great. It's got integers, surprise. 64-bit uh, integers, surprise. 32 and 64-bit floating point numbers, and that's it. It sounds kind of stupid, actually, when you say it like that. Um, but it's actually very simple. It's very low level. Functions are flat. There's no nested functions. There's only a single global table of functions. Uh, they're statically bound, so there's no like late binding of like I'm referring to this function by its name, but you have to go look up its name. You just refer to a function directly by its index. So when you compile code, you get a direct call. When you do indirect calls, they go through a table. And that's that's so that we can verify that you're calling something with the right signature, and we can actually generate safe code that is uh, that doesn't go smash stacks and stuff like that. The way state is handled is with a giant array. That's it. We're emulating a machine. This is a machine. And the execution stack is trusted, which means that when you call a function, you don't get pointers into its stack like you can in C. So you can't damage the stack. Okay, and that's because we want a sandbox web assembly. So the operations that you have on data types are all the standard set. You can do all the standard arithmetic. Um, which is completely uncontroversial, but it's impossible to actually get through the JavaScript sieve. So instead, we have WebAssembly. Um, and then it's like a simple RISC architecture. Load and sort of memory. You can call functions directly and call them indirectly. And this may be a somewhat controversial thing, but all the control flow in all functions is structured. So WebAssembly is not like a bytecode where you can jump around arbitrarily. It's really just an AST with high-level control structures. And there's a good reason for this, and I'll talk about it. It's about verification. Okay, so just to visualize what I just talked about. This is the WebAssembly virtual machine. It seems, when you put it like this, it seems really trivial, doesn't it? And that's actually a good thing. The linear memory is just a raw byte array. It's basically, you can bit bang there. It's defined to be little endian, so everything that goes in there, little endian writes, little endian reads. So you, can, so you can do, write your integers in there, write your doubles in there, and alias them. There's really uh, nice rules about making that portable. So it's a, very deterministic about what you're doing. Okay, so then you get your functions. You name them all with numbers. So we don't have to have symbolic names or symbolic linking. And you can make up your own table for calling functions indirectly. <laughs> you can do things like duplicating a function. And the reason why that is, is that when you compile C++, you can actually put the, the D tables in the indirect function table, which is not mutable. It's not part of the application state. So program bugs up here, or even attacks up here, don't change uh, C++ virtual tables, which is actually kind of nice. Kind of enforces a little bit uh, more safety guarantee. And then again, the execution stack is not part of the application state. That's hidden in the virtual machine. So, what do you do with the horribleness of C? And so now we're trading the horribleness of JavaScript for the horribleness of C. So how do we do that? So we basically say, all right, pointers are just integers into, and they're just indexes into the memory. Okay, C has the ability to alias the stack with pointers. How do you deal with that? And the answer is, well, you don't deal with that. You make the user deal with that. The user basically allocates their own addressable stack. Thankfully, LLVM has pretty good analysis to be able to do this minimally, so you only have to generate a small amount of addressable stack. And then, since everything above this line is all chaos in user land, we don't care if the C program crashes, blasts the stack. It doesn't, it doesn't break the execution stack. So it's completely sandboxed away. So anything that the C program does, it's all, in, it's all in this giant array. And that seems, it actually seems insane to people, but it's actually really fast. The bounds checks basically mean that every time we access the memory, we're going to check against the bounds of the memory. We measure that very carefully, and it's like on the order of 5%, typically. You can write micro benchmarks where that may be 20%. But actually, surprisingly enough, this model is fast. It's just basically as fast as C code. We're not talking about integer factors away. OK, so what does a binary code look like? So we're designing a binary code. The reason for that, instead of having uh, an AST, is because it's a compilation target, and it should be compact. So as I mentioned, people are shipping us 100 megabyte ASM.js files. Um, that's, and ASM.js is not particularly compact. 
So we want to do better by having a binary format. We basically want to design our way out of the parsing problem. The other thing is that we want a verifiable bytecode. So we have to type check the bytecode. We want to make that easy. And we want to make that one pass. So Java bytecode, unfortunately, does not have a linear pass for doing type checking. And that was actually one of, one of the design, uh, one of the uh, things that we looked at carefully uh, for design mistakes to avoid uh, was requiring multiple passes to verify. It should be easy to compile because we assume that this is going to go through a compilation step. We're not going to run this through an interpreter to warm it up. That doesn't make sense for low-level code. Um, so it should be really easy to not only verify, but also construct an IR for a compiler so you can generate, or to do a baseline JIT where you just spit out code as you're going. The other thing is that we want it to be extensible. We don't want to use up the entire opcode space. We want to make sure that the encoding has the ability to add new features in the future because that seems to happen over and over again. People want to extend these things after the fact. Okay, so those constraints, those goals, we ended up with a design where we have an AST, and the AST, as I mentioned, has structured control flow, has expressions, and has local variables. So instead of having a stack machine, which verification requires checking that stack heights match up, by having an AST and by having expressions, all that is essentially trivial. And we also allow AST nodes to be expressions, so you can do things like, uh, you'll see, you can nest a, a block inside of uh, an ad, for example. So you can have kind of side effects deep in there. And this is all, and also, as it turns out, encoding an AST with a very custom binary uh, representation is smaller than a stack machine, it's smaller than source code. <clears throat> the other thing that we're exploring too is to add the ability to add, to essentially renumber the opcodes in the application for better compression. All right, so WebAssembly, uh, excuse me, WebAssembly module. Uh, basically looks like this. Uh, I don't have all the sections here, but this is just a sketch. So if you're going to go out and implement WebAssembly based on this presentation, please instead look at this spec. But, uh, so we have some memory declaration, uh, which is going to talk about what the memory looks like, how big we want it to be. Uh, we've got function signatures, so we can talk about functions being typed and having a set number of arguments. We have the functions themselves, which has code. Um, we have a declaration of the indirect function table. Again, this is an immutable thing, but you get to control what its layout looks like at the beginning. And you can also have data sections, too. One thing that people do in JavaScript is they have huge arrays of data that are actually like numbers everywhere. And it's just some chunk of data, right? And actually, we don't generate that great of code uh, for that. So what they really want is just a data section, like a, uh, a dot data section in an L file. OK. so. In WebAssembly, you can essentially configure the memory up to some constraints. So we want to use virtual memory techniques to do the balance checks around memory. So we have some constraints on how your memory can be sized. It has to be essentially aligned to a page boundary. We define a page size of 64K. So as long as your memory is aligned to those, you can say the minimum size of your memory and the maximum size of your memory. And that's because you can actually grow your memory with an operation. It's not important to this talk, but it's something that's important for smaller devices where you can start with smaller memory and then grow it. And you can also say whether or not you want the memory to be exported to JavaScript so that JavaScript can have an alias to it and bang on it. And that's actually important for web integration. Um, so if you, for example, have a texture which is in your C++ program and it's raw data there, you can hand it to JavaScript with a zero copy operation and that can go to OpenGL, which can go to the GPU with, an un, with a zero copy operation. Okay, so sign signatures, I mean, there's not a, there, syntax doesn't look like this, um, but there's a binary encoding of, you know, uh, for each function, what's a signature? How many parameters does it take? What their types are? And then every function has a signature, it has some flags that talk about. Uh, attributes of it, and then it's got code, which is going to be the, the encoded AST. Indirect function table, as I mentioned, it's just you take your functions, you put them in a table so that you will be able to call them indirectly. And then the data is just some raw data in the binary. Okay, so 
I think Turbofan's pretty cool, and I thought it was really important to be able to go from bytecode to Turbofan in a single pass. Um, and we achieved that. It's basically one pass over the bytecodes to do verification and to construct the sea of nodes. I'm going to talk about in detail how the SSA environment tracks and controls and effect dependencies. We use a stack of if blocks and loops because we have this nice AST structure. We don't have to do a prepass over the bytecode to find block boundaries and stuff like that. We don't have to iterate or any, any of that to find out where the phi should go. So we're able to put phi's in all the right places. And <clears throat> we're able to generate, because WebAssembly is so low level, it basically only has machine level operations. So we only have machine level graph, which means that we don't have to do any lowering. So in, in the TurboFan uh, design, there's many lowering phases that go from JavaScript down to intermediate level to machine. And WebAssembly basically enters directly at machine level. So we can just do code. Code generation there. Um, we go through the, the scheduler, which actually does uh, loop optimizations like loop invariant code motion. It does duplication and pushing down. So it actually, there is some inherent optimization and scheduling that happens there. But we can also apply other optimizations if we like. So all the strength reduction optimizations that happen on machine uh, 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 machine level operators, like you know, multiplying by four becomes a shift and stuff like that. Dividing by a constant becomes you know multiplying by its inverse. And um, and then TurboFans, you may have heard me mention this, but it has very configurable calling, calling convention, so we're able to do essentially any calling convention we want. So there's no, it's just like a C call. Actually, it's better than C calls, because some, some C ABIs have pretty uh, inefficient calling conventions. All right, so what does an AST look like? I think you know what an AST looks like. But what does it look like as a binary? So there's actually kind of an inherent choice uh, there's many ways to slice this, but there's kind of two, two major ones. You can do a pre-order encoding in the AST, or you can do a post-order encoding in the AST, or something in between. Uh, we do something in between, but I'll show you just as an example what pre-order looks like. It basically is just as it says. I laid out the AST, so it's pretty obvious. Like, you come to an AST node, you put a byte there, which represents that AST node, and then you sort of recursively do the children in order. And, uh, you know, if you... If you do some tricks, basically, if you have something which is like a ternary uh, expression, then you can save some of, uh, some of this code space. And actually, if you are able to do other tricks, like you know, having immediates to locals, special bytecodes for locals number zero, you can actually get this code really small. So we're talking about four bytes just to express a return of some branch. And I think it's pretty tough to do better than that. Um, and if you were to look at like a stack machine bytecode, it would be bigger than that. All right, so I'm going to talk about how you decode the pre-order AST. I'm going to skip through it. We don't use pre-order. That was like a prototype. Um, but it'll give you an idea of how you make like a decoder for this fast. Um, so we're basically just going to rip through the bytecodes uh, top to bottom. So it basically works like a parser does. It works like a shift reduced parser that you might see in a textbook. But it doesn't work on characters, it works on bytes. And there's no delimiting, delimiting things anywhere because we sort of have this implicit juxtaposition property where a node is immediately, um, uh, the, node, uh, the children nodes come directly after uh, an AST node. So we have a production stack. Every time you come to a bytecode, you push something onto the production stack and you know how many children you expect. So an if will always have three children, there's, not, there's nothing, um, we have this property that you always know how many children an AST node will, will have. So when we have, the, when we have the production stack, we essentially have slots for, for all the ch children nodes. So we basically just start cranking through. You either push something onto the stack, or you take something off the stack, and you make it a child of the thing which is one level up on the stack. And you just keep doing this, and you run through the bytecode, and then you end up with a finished AST after all these steps. So production stack has gone away, but we basically built this data structure in one pass. And because all local variables are typed, um, and they must be declared beforehand, we can actually type check that all those, all those productions as we're building. OK, so I, I mentioned this. Uh, I'll give you an example of what a TurboFan graph looks like. Um, just to give you a flavor of how that, we don't actually build an AST, we actually build the IR instead. 
And building IR is actually very similar to building AST. As you can see, it's almost like an AST backwards. Um, a turbofan graph is all the edges going backwards. They always go from end to the top. There's control edges, which express the control flow of the program. There's value edges, which express the computation of the program. And then there's effect edges, which uh, represent um, ordering between effectful operations. You don't have to understand that in detail, just to know that this is like, this is a graph that's built, built up incrementally as you decode the bytecode. So to do, to do that, we need to do SSA renaming. Um, the SSA environment is basically tracked at each bytecode as you're going down and it's mutated as you go along. Um, so it tracks what the turbofan graph nodes that represent the computation that, that the locals refer to now and also the effect, which is how we line up these effect edges, and also the control, which is how we build that, that embedded con control graph. So just an example of how that works. Um, you see a bytecode which looks like this, which is uh, add two local variables together and then store it in, in one of the local variables. And it basically <coughs> is just one update in the SSA environment and, and building that, that graph node. <clears throat> so th we just manage SSA environments as we're going through the bytecode. Basically, SSA environments split when we, the control splits and they merge when the control merges. So we sort of like have a control flow graph embedded in this, <coughs> a virtual control flow graph embedded in this bytecode. Um, if you visualize it like that, it basically means that SSA environments are going to be used at the beginning of each of these blocks and they're computed by starting with an SSA environment, splitting the SSA environment when you come to a control flow branch, and then merging back when you're sort of finishing that branch. And there's a stack of them. You can basically, you can think of the decoder as following the code like this, uh, but instead actually it's using a stack to push and pop the SSA environments. Um, so that's actually really efficient, so we don't, don't waste memory by having too many SSA environments around. So, I mentioned there's multiple ways to skin this cat. You can do the same AST, but in a different representation, post-order representation. We tried both. I'll show you uh, how post-order differs. So if we looked at this AST, it's basically the same AST, but written in a different kind of order. And then when we emit the, emit, emit the bytecode, uh, it's like, you essentially have each operation following all of its child, all the children, which is the very definition of po post order. Okay, so the decoding algorithm for this is very similar to uh, the, pr the prior one, except that we don't need to do reduction actions. Or, or you can think of it as only reduction actions. Uh, every time we come to a bytecode, we're going to push something onto the stack. And any time we come to a bytecode which has inputs, we're going to take so we've pushed the constant three onto the stack and the constant four onto the stack. And then we come to uh, another local, so we push that onto the stack. Then we finally come to a node, uh, a bytecode, which actually takes inputs. So we're gonna pop them off the stack and create an actual representation of that multiplication, push it onto the stack, advance. And this way we actually build the exact same AST we actually build it more efficiently because we don't have to keep checking the thing that's on the top of the stack to see if we need to do a reduction. We actually measured the performance. It's like it's 2x difference. We're talking about basically being able to decode at 100, close to 100 megabytes a second. <coughs> All right, so we want to have this single pass verification. We want to be able to verify control flow properties so for example, um, you can have a block and you can break out of a block. So you can go to the end of a block. You can't go to uh, an arbitrary place in the code. You can only break in the same way that you can in a structured uh, programming language where you're breaking out of a labeled block. And you can do uh, single pass verification in either pre-order or a bracketed form, like a post-order form, by essentially just keeping track of the stack of these things. So that means that we never have irreducible control flow. We always have structured control flow. We can always verify that we have structured control flow, and we can do that in a single pass as we walk over the entire bytecode. And that's true for all, all the control uh, structures in that are supported. 
Okay. So there are questions about that. I know maybe the details of shift reduced parsing are not the most interesting thing in the world. So the goals were originally we wanted to have compact bytecode, smaller than minified JS. I showed you examples of how that's true, right? By having expressions, by having constructor control flow, and doing a custom byte encoding, it's actually very small. And even smaller than a stack machine. We can verify it in a single pass. We can construct the IR. Or we didn't build a baseline JIT, but Mozilla has, and they claim to be able to do pretty well um, just generating code as you, as you go through. I think it's extensible. I mean, we don't have to get into details of encoding. It's not important, but there's space in there to be able to add new things to modules and new, new things to the bytecode. We demonstrated that it's fast to decode. We have an implementation that does the single pass uh, IR construction. And we're actually compiling pretty fast. So there's been a lot of consternation about C of Node's compilers being slow. Our compiler is not slow. We're able to generate almost two megs a second. That's two megs of WebAssembly input uh, per second on a single thread. And with eight threads, we can do, you know, not the linear speed up, we can do seven megs a second. So that people are delivering applications that are 10 megabytes of WebAssembly code, which means that we can load the entire application, compile it in essentially two seconds. And obviously, that's the cold start. You would cache the code so that you can do even faster the second time. So we have, we have performance results. I don't want to give you detailed performance results. So that's not really the point of this talk. Um, but essentially, everything that we run, within we're within 20% of native execution speed. That's not even with all the optimizations turned on. And that's actually because we're cheating. That's because LVM does all the optimizations for us. And in a sense, the only, the only real things that are left is to do really good register allocation and really good instruction selection. And even in scheduling, um, even instruction scheduling doesn't even matter. Because LVM does a pretty good job. So in some sense, we're using a very sophisticated compiler as the back end of another sophisticated compiler. But I think that will pay off for us in the end because I think uh, there is room to do certain optimizations that, that make sense on one side of the fence versus the other. And that's actually an active area that we're exploring um, and we'll see how that pays out. And that, comparing the native execution speed is, ASM.js has been billed as native execution speed for the web, but it's, it's close, but it's not there. So you pay, at least on Chrome, it's st still about a 1.8 uh, execution time. So 80% slower. Um, so the other part of the delivering on the single pass compiler, our friends at Mozilla are working on that. Um, we haven't pursued that in, in V8. All right, so just a comparison why compiling WebAssembly is better than JavaScript, uh, ASM.js, in our opinion, just because we have types everywhere, we have real, arithmic, real arithmetic everywhere, and we don't have to deal with type annotations, we don't have to deal with range analysis or sophisticated compiler uh, analysis to show that this stupid operation should be an N32 operation. Um, I don't know if you've seen some of this before, but in ASM.js, we have very, you know, very sophisticated and very general rules about how we analyze uh, values in TurboFan graphs in, it, in order to prove that, they, that we can actually use integer arithmetic. So these are a selection of some of the rules. All this becomes unnecessary uh, if, we, if we have that type of information up front. And all this lowering which happens where we start out with JavaScript in the beginning and we burn it away incrementally by doing these rules, which is a lot of fun, a lot of good employment for compiler engineers, uh, it becomes unnecessary with, with uh, WebAssembly. But, as I mentioned before, all of those machine level op uh, optimizations that you would do in a compiler, like all the strength reduction, constant folding, phi simplification, control flow reductions, reassociation, all those things still apply. So by using TurboFan and, and the, uh, the architecture we have now, so you have nodes, we can apply all those optimizations and um, we get better code. So we reuse the actual piece of the compiler, compiler pipeline that, that are important. We do more with GVN, uh, also works on the, on the sea of nodes. We, we don't do GVN on WebAssembly um, just because I think LVM's generally been, been doing a, a good enough job, but who knows what other producers will, will give us. Where is WebAssembly now? WebAssembly 
already has three browser engines that have some support. So in Chrome V8, we have it on behind a flag. I mean, that thing I showed you, that is actually our canary. Um, so you can actually flip a flag in the browser and you can start running WebAssembly. The same is true for Firefox. There's a similar flag where you can flip it. And I didn't show the demo um, in Firefox, but they run the same thing, same smoothness, same speed. We're really, really close. So the, the sort of performance shootout is not quite as, as heated there. There's not like these big integer factors difference between browsers at all. And Microsoft has uh, also got an experimental build where they support WebAssembly too. And we talked to these, we talked to our, our friends every other week. Um, this is an active area of development and design. And uh, we can't really say anything about what Apple's plans are because they don't seem to say anything about what their plans are. Um, we hope to ship version one this summer. That's an aggressive goal. It's a goal shared by at least Mozilla. Um, I think the two of us shipping together is, I mean, Edge's whole release process is beyond my knowledge. It's tied to Windows, so they're not able to commit to shipping this summer. But we're both trying to get this done. And shipping does not require standardization, which is the awesome thing about the web. You can ship something that's not standardized. Um, but standardization will happen in, in parallel, uh, concurrently with improving MVP, adding features to MVP, and stuff like that. So we'll start a standardization process to make this into a bona fide, I don't know, W3 standard, W3 standard, something like that. So that's all I have. Questions about WebAssembly V8, VMs, life? <laughs>